We're set. We're starting a time for confidence, right? Is that we are? All right. So uh, here's an introduction and some uh, lesson objectives for this study. Uh, Dr. Nichols, it says, our history has demonstrated that there is nothing new under the sun. In this lesson, Dr. Nichols pulls from the history of the church to sketch models of godly confidence for us to follow through the cultural confusion of our day. Lesson objectives. One, to remind us of the importance of putting our confidence in the right place. Lesson objective number two, to connect the past with the present to prove it is a time for confidence. He gives two scripture readings, uh, two scriptures for uh, reading ahead. First scripture is Joshua 1 and 9, where it says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you, wherever you go, in Ecclesiastes 1 and 9. As we see, Ecclesiastes is timeless. You can always go back to Ecclesiastes and, and, and uh, get some type of uh, understanding for why things are the way they are today. He says here, Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, what has been is what will be, <laughs> and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. And so that's his introduction and lesson objectives. So before we get started, we'll open with prayer. Father, no doubt, any time in which uh, we live and find uh, challenges is a time to, uh, to be courageous, is a time to be confident. And so, Father, as we go through this study, we pray that you will strengthen our faith, uh, strengthen our resolve so that we may live in a way uh, that is firm all the way to the end. And, Father, that requires not only uh, knowing the truth, but it's also understanding how your truth applies to the time in which we live. And not only that, but even personally, how do these truths impact us or impact our lives personally uh, in, the, in the world in which we live? And so, Father, I pray that as we go through these, uh, these, this study, that you would uh, build us up in our faith for the sake of Christ, for his glory, and for the glory of your kingdom, and in his name I pray, amen. We're talking about confidence, a time for confidence. But I don't want to start in the 21st century. I want to go back to the church fathers. So let's tell a tale of two church fathers. You all remember, of course, your Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Well, if we want to tell the story, we could say it was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. The year is 420. Now, for the last decade or so, the Vandals, and the barbarians. And if you're not a Roman, right, you're a barbarian. So that's the definition. You're either a Roman or a barbarian. So the barbarians are literally at the gate. In fact, they have pushed down the gate. This great empire of Rome was threatened. And so we have two church fathers who respond. One is Jerome. Now, uh, Jerome was born in a region of, of the Roman Empire called Dalmatia. Today, it's modern-day Slovenia. He showed exceptional talent as a young man, as a scholar. He was brilliant. So they sent him to Rome to study. So it's very easy to remember. 
Jerome goes to Rome. It even has a nice rhyme, right? So he goes to Rome, becomes quite a scholar. In fact, it's Jerome and his, his sort of claim to fame is that he's the one who gives us the Latin Vulgate. This is the, the, the Vulgate is the Latin word for common. And so Latin was the common language of the empire. Greek had subsided, Latin had come onto the scene. And so Jerome gives us the Latin Vulgate. He was a scholar most of his life. And then in the 410s, Rome starts to crumble. Jerome thought Rome was it. He thought this was the savior of the world. And when Rome started to crumble, he thought all would be lost. He spends the last year of his life hiding out in a cave in Bethlehem, and in 420, he dies. Well, there's another church father, Augustine. We all know Augustine, his great work, The Confessions, where he uh, tells this wonderful story of the hound of heaven tracking him down and how God brings Augustine to himself. Well, Augustine goes on to be the Bishop of Hippo Regis. This is an area of North Africa. It's Islam country where uh, Augustine was the Bishop. And so he sees the same thing happening. And what does he do? He goes into his study and he writes a book. And he writes a wonderful book called The City of God. Now, I just happen to have my copy of City of God conveniently located up here. But it's a very long book, and early on in the book, uh, this is one of the things that Augustine tells us. He says, that this is a great work, this, it's arduous. And by great, he doesn't mean it's going to be excellent. He means it's going to be long, because he's going to tell the story of human history. A story told on two planes, the city of God and the city of man. So he says, an arduous work, this, which raises us not by a quiet human arrogance, but by a divine grace, above all earthly dignities that totter. Do you hear that word he uses? That totter on this shifting scene. Now, this is a total opposite. Here's Jerome. He sees the barbarians at the gate, and he says, the world is in ruins, yes and he goes off into his cave. Augustine looks at this and says, we're going to take a perspective, a transcendent perspective on what's happening on the horizon of the temporary and the temporal and the earthly, because what happens on the earthly is the tottering, shifting sands. And so he writes a book, 869 pages in my English translation. I'll skip the middle because we just don't have that much time together, and we'll go right to the end. So sometime I've read for you the beginning, I'll read from you from the end. Sometime you have to make a deal with me that you'll go back and read the whole middle. Uh, in fact, there's a funny line at the end of this book where he says, uh, some may think I wrote too much. I'm not sure who that is, who would think that he wrote too much. Uh, some would say I wrote too little. Uh, and then he says, I think I wrote just right. Kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? But at the end of the book, uh, this is what he says about the kingdom of God when it's the final reality. How great shall be that felicity, right? Old word for happiness. How great shall be that happiness, which shall be tainted with no evil, which shall lack no good, and which shall afford leisure for the praise of God, who shall be all in all. There shall be the enjoyment of beauty. True honor shall be there. True peace shall be there. God himself, who is the author of all virtue, shall be there and shall be its reward. See, Augustine could have this perspective on what was happening in Rome and the collapse of the Roman Empire because he had his confidence in the right place. And Jerome goes off when the sand starts shifting and he can't quite, he feels like he's not getting his feet under him. He's got his confidence in the wrong place. He's got his confidence in the Caesar. He's got his confidence in Rome. 
it's the wrong place. And when that wrong thing gets shaken, he pulls a chicken little. Remember chicken little? Sleeping under the tree, the acorn falls on his head. He thinks part of the sky has broken away. And now that portends really bad things to come because the sky is falling. And so there's little chicken little running around saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And that's exactly what Jerome did because the world was going to end in 420. Didn't it? No. Okay. So we're here today, a few more centuries past 420. So it's an interesting tale, and it sets the stage for us to think about the moment we find ourselves in. Let's think about the time that we live in right now. Now, we could pull any number of examples. Uh, we could go uh, to the summer of 2015, and we could talk about the Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage. We could go back the summer before, and we could pull out what is a relatively small thing that happened, but the mayor of Houston issued subpoenas for sermons preached in the city of Houston to see if there was hate language in those sermons. Seemed like a relatively small thing. We could look to those kinds of things. We could look to pop culture. There was a particular commercial I was watching, and it tells the story of a, of a lady who gets up, and she has a breakfast food, and there's this sort of silhouette of her partner, and as the commercial ends, we realize it's another woman, right? Just mainstreaming what would have been five years ago, 10 years ago, would not even been on the horizon in legislation, in court decisions, and in TV commercials for public consumption. So we're talking about a time of change, a time of change that I would argue is systemic and rapid. We're also talking about a time of confusion. I was reading recently this article by some sociologists who spoke of cultural confusion. And that's a term, it's sort of a technical term that they want to use to speak of how categories are sort of getting jumbled up. And that cultural confusion also is contributing then not just to a jumbling of categories, but a lack of decisions, whether they're ethical decisions or legal decisions being made on principles. There's a confusion and there's a change. And all of this can result in an uncertainty, a sense that I just don't feel like I have my feet under me, a sort of a Rip Van Winkle moment. Although decades did not pass, really only a couple of years passed. We could call it cultural whiplash, right? So this is the time we live in. And there's a lot of folks who want to say, chicken little, the sky is falling, the end is near, right? We want to be like Jerome's, and we want to go off to our cave in Bethlehem and live out the last year of our life. I don't think that's the right response. In one sense, some of this cultural shakeup there might be a silver lining here. In one sense, some of this cultural shakeup might just be a good thing because it might cause us, if we were a little bit like Jerome, putting our confidence in the wrong things, putting our confidence in culture, putting our confidence in celebrities, putting our confidence in getting the right guy in the White House, putting our confidence in getting the right judges to sit on the right courts. Some of this cultural shakeout might actually be a positive thing because it might just cause us to raise a question, where is our confidence placed? Uh, were any of you on sports teams and you had a coach, right? Did, you ever, did your coach ever tell you this expression, you lack 
confidence. Have you ever heard that from a coach? I had a swim coach who uh, would always carry two things, a whistle and a kickboard. Now the kickboard came in handy because you know, you're swimming, you get water in your ear, you can't hear a single thing and you're under the water and you're moving. So the kickboard was a really handy thing because when you got near a wall and the coach wanted to tell you something, all he needed to do was take that kickboard and just bop you on the head and he'd have your attention and he'd tell you something. And I specifically remember this time, I was working on a backstroke flip turn and I just wasn't getting it right. And I'd swim out to the flags and I'd go into the wall and I'd try to get the turn and then I'd come out and I'd go back into the wall. And I was doing this over and over and over again and I just wasn't quite getting it right. Coach comes up to me, bop, right on the head. I look up, all bleary, red-eyed at him, yes, coach. And he says, do you know what your problem is? And I start running through the encyclopedia of my mind. I think there's a lot of answers to that question. And he says, you lack confidence, right? I had a friend growing up uh, who was interested in a particular girl, was not very successful in securing a date with this particular girl. And I was at his house at the time and we were chatting and his dad was there. And he's trying to explain the situation to his dad and looking for some fatherly advice. And his father looks at him and he says, well, you know what the problem is? You lack, and he goes, I know, I know, I lack confidence. And he said, well, actually I was gonna say, you lack a car, but <laughs> you also lack confidence. Here's the thing about confidence though. In some instances, it is a question of degrees. So if you're gonna be an athlete and you're gonna stare down the goal, you need to have confidence. Right. You attack any work project, you've gotta have a certain level of confidence. You walk into a situation that requires a delicate handling of it, you need confidence. But there's also a sense in which confidence is really not about a degree. It's not a continuum the issue is not why well, I need more confidence. The real question is, what is the object of my confidence? So I think we can answer this question. So what we are talking about is we are at a time for confidence. Now, I like that word. I think we could say it's a time for courage. And we're going to say that. It's a time for moral courage. There's a moment in Pilgrim's Progress where Bunyan has Christian say, I could go along with the crowd, so to speak. I could go along here with the expectation, but I won't. And even if it means I have to stand my ground until the moss covers my eyes, I pray that God will grant me the courage to do the right thing. So we can talk about this is a time for courage in light of moral confusion, in light of shifting sands, in light of what we're facing. We could also talk about conviction, and I want to. This is a time for conviction. When the cultural pressure which has shifted now. So we, we enjoyed a, a certain moment in especially American Christianity where it was very acceptable to be a Christian, very acceptable to be a churchgoer, very acceptable to speak of the good book culturally. A lot of that's eroding. And so the pressure is, well, maybe I need to pull back a little bit. Maybe I need to not be so vocal about my beliefs. Uh, maybe I need to sort of tuck away certain views that are just simply not culturally palatable anymore. And we begin to cower and we begin to cave and we even just simply capitulate and give it all up and just go to the other side. We're gonna talk about that 
in a few sessions later. Specifically, when we're talking about our confidence needs to be in the Word and in Scripture, especially at times when that Word is being challenged. And make no mistake about it, we are seeing in these cultural issues that are happening, underlying them is a challenge that God's Word no longer applies and God's Word no longer has authority or speaks meaningfully to human existence. Make no mistake about it, that's what we're talking about. So it's a time for courage, it's a time for conviction. I really think it's a time for confidence, that our confidence needs to be in God. There was a moment in Israel's history, and I want to turn our attention to this text. There was a moment in Israel's history where the sky was falling. Babylon was bearing down on Jerusalem. And Judah didn't have a chance against the Babylonian army. And Jeremiah knew it. And he knew it had nothing to do with Babylon's might. It had to do with Israel breaking covenant. And God made it very clear. Follow the law and you will be blessed in the land. Set aside the law, transgress the law, and you will be punished. And you may very well find yourself out of the land. Judah, the tribes to the south, had the example of the north. They saw it happen. They saw Assyria take the northern tribes, and there Judah persisted in its rebellion, in its disobedience, in its disdain for God's law. And so Jeremiah comes on the scene. It's truly the 11th hour as Jeremiah is writing his book. And in chapter 9, at verse 23, he says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Wisdom's a good thing. Read the book of Proverbs. How many times are we in the book of Proverbs instructed to get wisdom? So, at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, when Jeremiah says, uh, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. We really have to ask what's happening here. And then he says, let not the mighty man boast in his might. And let not the rich man boast in his riches. I think the thing we see here is these are the sort of this plane kind of things that we can see. These are the temporal, the horizontal plane, the temporal existence kinds of things that we can see and that we want to almost reflexively put our trust in. So I have my wisdom, I have my might, and I have my riches, so bring it on, Babylon. None of those things are going to work. But let him who boasts, boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight." It's very clear what Jeremiah is telling his audience. You put your confidence in the wrong things. It's, It's like showing up for a final exam and you're all prepared, but you studied for the wrong exam, and none of that's going to help you to put that onto the exam. They were preparing for the wrong exam and they were putting their confidence in the wrong things. And they needed to put their trust and their confidence in God. The year 1527 was a hard year for Martin Luther. You would have thought it was a great year. It was the 10th anniversary of the posting of the 95 Theses. The new church was up and running. Students were at the college at Wittenberg. This is the start of grand new things. It was a hard year for Luther. The plague had hit Wittenberg. His family members fell ill. He was ordered to leave. All the faculty of the university were ordered to leave by Frederick the Wise. Luther decided to stay to care for the sick. Martin and Katie had lost an infant son that year in 1527. They were still in the throes of the war the peasants revolt and Luther tried to mediate some of that and coming out of the war both the peasants thought he had turned on them and the nobility thought he had turned on them. He really came out sort of lost on both sides. 
It was a hard year for Luther. And he wrote a hymn. And you know the hymn. It's the hymn of Luther's that we love. It's a mighty fortress is our God. It's so all this distress in his life, this world with devils filled, this world with devils filled, there's unrest, there's tension, there's unease, there's I do not feel the ground beneath my feet in that hymn. And so where does Luther turn? He turns just as the psalm that he bases this hymn on, Psalm 46. The God of Jacob is our fortress. He turns to God and he puts his trust in God. And as he puts his trust in God, he recognizes that he's also putting his trust in Christ. That one word that will fall all of our enemies, that one word that will fall all of those things that stand against us, and that one word above all earthly powers. Let's not forget that. No thanks to them, that word abides. And so Luther says our confidence must be in God, our confidence must be in the Word, our confidence must be in Christ and in the power of His gospel. And then, you know how he ends it? If that's the case, the body, they may kill. How glibly do we sing that? You know, when I, when I sing that, I think, Luther always was a man of extremes. <laughs> Nothing was ever halfway with Luther. It's not, oh, well, they might hurt me. No. The body they may kill. Is that true? Like, is that existentially true? Because God's truth abideth still. And here is the singular truth that abides. It's the same truth that Augustine used as his anchor when Rome was falling. It's the exact same truth that Jeremiah, the mouthpiece of God, was being used to tell the people of Israel was the singular reality that they had forgotten about. And it is this singular truth. His kingdom is forever. That's the reality. And so no matter what is happening in our time, it's a time for confidence. Next time, we'll look more closely at what it means to have our confidence in God. We've been talking about a time for confidence, and in this session, we're going to talk about our confidence must be in God. To help us get a handle on this, we're going to go back to Isaiah chapter 40. This has to be one of the most beautiful chapters in all of Scripture, Isaiah chapter 40. You know, it begins with these great words, comfort, comfort my people. And of course, you almost can't read that without hearing Handel's Messiah uh, going off in the back of your head. What is happening here is that we have had chapter upon chapter of judgment. This is a bleak book, Isaiah, from chapters 1 to 39. You begin looking at the nations, you begin looking at Israel, and you just see oracle of judgment upon oracle of of judgment. And then all of a sudden at chapter 40, the tone now shifts. And it shifts, in fact, sometimes these last chapters of the book, chapters 40 to 66, are sometimes called the book of comfort because those first chapters are so harsh in their judgment. Well, what we have here is Isaiah prophesying ahead of Israel's captivity in Babylon. But not only does 
Isaiah see that Israel is going to be taken captive by Babylon. The writing is literally on the wall, so just about anybody could see that if they were paying attention. But what Isaiah also prophesies is not only will you be taken, but you will be brought back. And so when we get into these chapters, we have now gone past judgment, and now we are talking about restoration. And so the opening verses of chapter 40 assure Israel that they will be restored to the land. And that is why this is a book of comfort. You will be brought back to the land. But I want to think about this for a little bit. So let's put ourselves in the campfire, right? In Babylon, and we are the captive Israelites in exile. And we have the Isaiah scroll. And we're reading that we're just going to simply waltz back to our homeland. Now let's think this through. For one thing, between where we are and Israel is a huge desert. So we've got geography to overcome. But much more palatable or much more formidable than that is Babylon. In order for this to happen, the king is just going to have to up and decide out of the magnanimous joy of his heart that we can go back home. And of course, Babylon is going to pass off the scene and Medo-Persia, Cyrus is going to be the guy. Now, if you know anything about world history, you wouldn't look at Cyrus and think that he's got a magnanimous heart who just wants to do kind things for people. He's interested in conquering the world. And so if we're sitting there and we're hearing that God's going to restore us, I think this would raise a question. Really? Is God able to fulfill this promise? So as I look at verses 12 through the end of the chapter, what I see here are a series of demonstrations of God's power. So that as God promises to restore Israel, like a, like a shepherd will gather up the lambs and, and carry them in his bosom and take them back to the safety of their sheep pen, Israel will be brought back to the land they will be restored. And you can count on it. God is a faithful God. And if you put your confidence in God, you will not be let down. And so here we have a series of demonstrations of God's power. In this chapter, or in these verses, from verse 12 through the end of the chapter, we're going to see that God's power is demonstrated over creation. We'll see the waters and the mountains and the like and the stars. We're going to see that God's power is demonstrated over the nations. And we're going to see that God's power is demonstrated over the false gods. And we're going to see a final demonstration of God's power as Isaiah brings this chapter to a close. So let's take a look at it. And you see it there in verse 12 of Isaiah chapter 40. And from verses 12 to 13, we have the first demonstration of God's power over creation. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Now, of course, you look at any one of these and you think of the great waters, right? And if any of you have ever just seen the ocean or been on an ocean-going vessel, you recognize what a tremendous force this is of the waters. And yet, they are simply in the hollow of His hand, right? The grandeur of God, the greatness of God, and then the heavens. Now, this is Isaiah's day. And our day, we've got the Hubble telescope that is still out there beaming back the galaxies and showing us these remarkable pictures 
of not just the stars, but of the galaxies. And yet, Isaiah tells us that God measures them with a span, right? And then these great mountains. Now, I used to live in Pennsylvania, and, and central Pennsylvania where we had hills. I grew up in western Pennsylvania, not too far from original Ligonier country, and there we had mountains. We had the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We had genuine mountains. In fact, to get from where I lived up to Ligonier, you had to go about three miles up on the mountain, up where Ligonier was. But in Florida, it's pretty flat. You could get yourself up on the top of a roof of a house, and you can see pretty far. So we really have to go somewhere else if we live in Florida to see mountains. But when you do see mountains, immediately, as you are dwarfed by them, you recognize the grandeur of mountains. And yet, you can almost see Isaiah trying to portray this for us as God just sort of plops down a mountain in creation. So all of these things that awe us in the natural world, God is powerful over them. Isaiah turns to the false gods. He says in verse 14, whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Now, it seems like at this point, Isaiah has sort of shifted gears from what theologians talk about as the attribute of God as omnipotent, that is, he is all-powerful, that Isaiah now is talking about God as omniscient. He is all-knowing. And so who has taught him? There's something else that I think is going on here. In the Babylonian pantheon of gods, the supreme god was Marduk. Now, I always have to remind myself it's Marduk, not Marmaduke. Remember, Marmaduke is the big dog, the cartoon. Okay, that's not the Babylonian god. It's Marduk. But Marduk takes counsel with the other gods. So when Marduk needs to make a decision, he brings together, like a president would bring together his cabinet, or a king would bring together his advisors, Marduk assembles the gods. And so he consults with, you know, the, the, the god of thunder, and he consults with this god, and then once he gathers that information, he makes a decision. This is a direct frontal assault that God is more powerful than the Babylonian gods. And why is this important? See, in the ancient world, if one nation conquered another nation, it meant very simply this, that nation's gods were the superior gods. And so you often find this in the Old Testament. You know, the, the Israel is crying out for God to vindicate His name by protecting Israel. And so the idea here is, if Israel's conquered, what does that say about the Babylonian gods? And clearly here, God is demonstrating that He is over Marduk and that He is over the false gods. Then we turn to the nations. You all remember the story of Eric Little. Eric Little was a, a son of missionaries in China, medical missionaries. And of course, he's famous for his winning bronze and especially gold in the 1924 Paris Olympics. But he also had this wonderful life after the Olympics where he went back to China and served as a missionary for the remainder of his life. But there's that moment in the movie, Chariots of Fire, and there's a little bit of license going on there in the movie, where Eric Little, who was a sprinter, and his main race was the 100-meter dash. His secondary race was the 200 meters. Those are both considered sprinting distances, right? And in the movie, we find out that he gets to Paris, and like the week ahead of the time trials for the 100, he finds out that they're on a Sunday. Well, sorry to sort of shatter the drama of the movie. He actually knew, they all knew, the schedule was posted a couple months before, so it wasn't quite a dramatic moment as the movie makes it out to be but it still is a dramatic moment. He had trained for years for the 100 meter dash. This was his race. And he's a Scottish Presbyterian, so he takes remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy very seriously. And so he will not run. 
and the time trial on a Sunday. Now, let's just imagine that the movie's accurate for a moment. So in the movie, they bring in the Prince of Wales. So I'm not sure all of the duties that are on the Prince of Wales agenda, but apparently one of them is making sure the British Olympic athletes stay in line. So they bring in the British Prince of Wales to admonish him for a country that he needs to run in the 100, because that's their chance for gold. And he stands up to that pressure. And in fact, in the movie, and this part is true, instead of running in the 100 meter time trials, he preaches. And guess what text he uses? Of course he's going to use Isaiah chapter 40 because it has people running at the end and soaring like eagles. This is a great text to boost your confidence before you go into the Olympics. But he also reads it because of this. Look at this at verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Little did not cower or cave under the pressure of his king. He recognized that the nations are like a little drop that just goes right into the bucket. Recognize the nations for what they are. And behind the nations, in that power of the nations that they represent, and sometimes that power is so strong, it's all we can see. It blocks the sun, as it were. And we can't see beyond the horizon of our existence because all we see is what is in front of us, the nations. But the true perspective is they are a drop in the bucket. And Little knew this. Little knew this. Of course, he got bronze in the 200, and then he trained for the 400. And this is a remarkable thing. The 400 is not considered a sprint. It's considered a middle distance. And sprinters don't usually make for good middle distance runners. And Little shocked the world when he took gold in the 400 at the 1924 Paris Olympics. Well, as we go back to the text at verse 18, we turn our attention back to the false gods. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? And here's where uh, a little sarcasm comes out. I love this in here, and I love it when the biblical authors get a little sarcastic, and here is a case where we see that. A craftsman casts it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it for silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move or totter. So be careful you don't get a shoddily made wooden idol because it may just not sit right on the shelf. And you know, when the kids come in the house and they go buzzing by, they might just cause enough disturbance to knock it over. How silly is it? these Babylonians were putting their confidence in these idols made by man. And so we're reminded that God demonstrates his power over the false gods. We return to creation in verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing, we're back to the nations again, and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Yes, even Cyrus, even Cyrus, the great Medo-Persian king, armies just simply melted when he came onto the scene. So great was his reputation. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. It's a wonderful conclusion reached in verse 25. It's a rhetorical question. 
To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. So we have here these series of God's demonstrations of his power, but he has saved the best demonstration of his power for last. And that is God ultimately delights in demonstrating his power in his people. We're going to see this in these last few verses. So as we look at how this closes, we find what is a very honest question. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My right is disregarded by my God. So let's go back to the campfire. Remember last time we visited the campfire, we were hearing that God's going to restore us. We have our doubts. God just demonstrated all these things. Now we have another question. But what about me? Does God notice my situation? Yes, I can check the box. He's creator, so he's more powerful than creation. Yes, if we press far enough, we will say the nations really are a drop in the bucket. Yes, we know, we know how ludicrous false gods are. So we can check that box. But what about in this particular situation? Does God notice? And does God care? There's an injustice here. My right, right, as his people, to enjoy his promise, will that go disregarded? Does God notice me? Well, we speak to this, don't we, in the next few verses. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Now we're going to see it applied. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Well, that makes perfect sense. Those who need power, God gives it to them. But there's another category here. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Do you know what the uh, world record is for the high jump? I had to look this up. It is eight feet point zero three inches. Can you imagine? We should put a, a mark on the wall of where eight feet is. A human being cleared eight feet point zero three inches. It was Javier Santamayor. He was from Cuba. And in 1993, he set the world record. Amazing feat. He's still alive. I don't know how high he is jumping, but I'm pretty sure he's not clearing eight feet anymore. No matter how strong we seem to be, how invincible we seem to be, we have our limitations. And so even the youth, and Isaiah is going to go on to say, uh, young men, right? That symbol of human vigor and of human strength and of human capacity and of human power, even that will have its limits. And the youth will faint and the young men will fall exhausted. It was a couple weeks ago at Reformation Bible College. We had an Ultimate Frisbee tournament. I'd never played Ultimate Frisbee in my life. You have to run a lot in Ultimate Frisbee. And these are 18 to 22-year-olds, and they seem to have no stop to their energy. And then I read a verse like this, and I think, oh, yes, eventually they'll be, get weary, and I can't wait to watch them fall exhausted. <laughs> See what Isaiah is trying to do here? He's trying to say, no matter where you sort of find yourself, there is a limit. And that's a good thing. Because if there's not a limit, you know where you would put your confidence in? You put it in yourself. But your confidence must be in God. And so Isaiah tells us, but they who wait for the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Now, every time I look at this, I think I do not get that order. 
it really should be reversed. It seems anticlimactic. We start off soaring like eagles. That's pretty exciting. Then we're running. Okay, I like that. But then we're just walking. How common, how ordinary. Isaiah got it wrong. We really need to reverse the order. We walk, and then we run, and then we soar like eagles. But how right this is. It's a metaphor, so let's not overdo the metaphor. But how infrequently do we need that sort of burst of soaring like an eagle? And even occasionally, the run. But then it's the constant, the common, the ordinary, and it's the walk. And at every turn, God's power is there to meet us. And so, we can rightly put our confidence in God. Dr. Sproul has said this many times. Recently, in a conversation with him, he mentioned this. He, Our problem really is this. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. That's our fundamental problem. And this this text only scratches the surface. We're talking about God's omnipotence here and His omniscience. We could be talking about God's faithfulness. We'd be talking about His purity, His holiness, His righteousness, that God is life, that God is light, that God is love, that He's full of mercy, that His compassion knows no bounds, that He is kind, most kind, that He is omnibenevolent, all good. This is who God is, and this is where our confidence must be. It can't be in ourselves, and it can't be in the nations. It, it can't be in those idols. It can only be in God. Our confidence must be in God. You know, I didn't quite get it right when I said, that ultimately God delights to demonstrate His power in His people. Because the only reason that we can soar like eagles and run and knock our weary and walk and not faint is because there was one who did faint. There was one who could not walk, who was literally crushed by the weight of the cross. And it is because God sent His Son. And that ultimately God demonstrated His power, demonstrates His power in the Son. And in the Son's death on the cross that we can claim this promise. The ultimate demonstration of God's power is in the cross and in the Son. And because of that, he delights to demonstrate His power in our lives, and our confidence has to be in Him. It must be in Him. Next, we're going to look at how our confidence also needs to be not only in God, but also to put our confidence in the Word that God gave us. We'll look at that next time together.